Well, hi everybody. I'm not sure what time your watch says or your phone or whatever. It's probably not 11.15, but I'm here today to uh, give you some information about chapter 19 in your textbook. It happens to be uh, one of my favorite time periods in all of art history, and it's the Baroque period. Today, um, we are going to take a look uh, only at some Italian Baroque work, and I hope that you'll find it interesting, and um, I appreciate your attention. All right, everybody, um, we are now going to start studying Chapter 19, the Baroque style in Western Europe, and today I'm going to be featuring only uh, the Italian Baroque um, Images that I want you to know and a couple of artists that are very important uh, in terms of this. You, by the way, should have gotten uh, an email from me with some uh, topic choices for the next paper and so on. Um, so if you have any questions, email me what they might be. So uh, I'm not going to get too confused, okay? Uh, chapter 19 starts on page 332, and you will ultimately only be responsible for the images that are in chapter 19 that I'm going to show you today. And I don't even have, I believe, all of these images from Art Store. So, uh, the Baroque period. The late uh, 1600s and into 1700. Uh, it's a very, very interesting uh, time period for many reasons. The Counter-Reformation was going on, and so there was lots of upheaval. Um, and the word Baroque itself was uh, a very uh, negative term at the time, which frequently art terms are extremely negative, interestingly. Like Impressionism, for example, that was just negative. Baroque was the same. It's a, from a Portuguese word that, uh, and I always found this kind of just weird, but a Portuguese word for an imperfect pearl, pearl as in an oyster pearl, because you know, pearls are, are theoretically perfect, not always, obviously, but they're perfectly round and shiny and all that. Well, um, an imperfect pearl has lots of uh, edges and curls and curves and that sort of thing, and that's certainly what defines the visual aspect of the Baroque time period. It also has a lot of stuff going on. That's probably one of the reasons I like it so much, because I like a lot of stuff going on. You should probably see my house sometime. Too much stuff, uh, much of the time. Anyway, so we're gonna look at the first image here which is by an incredible, incredible painter and, uh, and an awful, awful person. So often that happens to be the, the situation. Caravaggio uh, is what we call this particular artist. His first name is Michelangelo de Marese Caravaggio. We call him Caravaggio because that is in fact where he's from. So when you see uh, him with his labels on her pictures, for example, don't be confused thinking that it is our Michelangelo. Michelangelo, after all, is just Michael. It's just, you know, for the Italians, it's just kind of an ordinary name. Um, this painting is called The Calling of St. Matthew, and it is um, considerably larger than the image we see here um, as a slide. And what we are experiencing here is uh, Jesus coming in and pointing out to Matthew that he is going to come and be a disciple. Uh, Caravaggio, in addition to being such an incredible uh, painter, was able to um, bring together models that he would find sometimes in the slums, on the streets, sometimes uh, just people that he knew in some other way to pose for him. And then he would, in fact, uh, he was known for no preliminary drawings. He would just start painting them on the surface of his canvases. Uh, in this uh, painting, um, we see Jesus right here, this tiny little sliver of a halo, which is so incredibly powerful, uh, caught at this moment. There's a lot more emotion in this painting than I think we've probably seen in any of the images that I've shown you before. That could be incorrect, but that's what I'm thinking right now. Um, and look at the lighting. The lighting is so incredibly unusual. And there are lots and lots of curves. This is a very active painting. The Baroque style is very active with curves and curls. 
and diagonals and so on. This certainly is no exception. Uh, there is a, a, a wonderful a church in Rome, and most of uh, the Caravaggios that I've seen have I've seen in Rome. Uh, a lot of Baroque art is, is also in Rome. Uh, and this one um, is certainly one of those. It's caught at this particular moment. This theatrical lighting, as if they were sort of characters on a stage with set lighting coming in on them, is called uh, tenebrism. Well, that's an Americanized uh, way of, of this word, il tenebroso, which means sort of in the dark with light. So it's chiaroscuro, which you know the definition of that, the modeling of form using lights and darks, times 10. Uh, it's, it's dramatic, where we have a highlight and an instantly going dark. Uh, and, it, and it really invigorates it with much more drama than we've seen in lots of other uh, images. Um, this um, is in your book on page 346. Now, the, the order of the images I'm going to show you is not necessarily going to be in the order that these images are presented in your book, so bear with me with that. It was just too complicated to try to now rearrange these images for this particular lecture. Um, I'm going to not just do this sort of thing with every single movement, like I'm not going to do the, the next style that follows this this way. So I do need your feedback about, you know, it, is this working? Am I too boring? Is it just, or whatever. I can handle it, because I am, like probably all of us, struggling to try to figure out how to deliver this, because this stuff matters so much. Um, you'll find out, I think, hopefully. Uh, let's go on to the next image. Um, this is uh, not in your book. Uh, I, m many of these are not going to be in your book. Let me just emphasize that. This is uh, David and Goliath. This is, of course, a theme we've seen other artists um, use before. And in this case, um, the young David is holding the head of Goliath, which is a self-portrait of Caravaggio. Caravaggio, as you can see, was, uh, and, and he was quite harsh with himself, I think, in this, um, in this painting. Uh, he was a, a very, very complicated man. He broke the law a lot. He was, uh, he was in jail. He was, uh, he was as a criminal. He was, and actually, he was a murderer. Um, he killed a man over a, a tennis match, a game that they were playing, stabbed him in the groin. And, and uh, anyway, so he was a very uh, complicated, but at the same time, extraordinary artist. Uh, and at the time, his work was appreciated, especially by other artists, not so much by a lot of other sources, but there were a few, fortunately, and that's actually how we have them, a few uh, cardinals in particular, and a pope along the way, um, who, who embraced Caravaggio and his work. We can uh, go on to the next image. Another uh, self-portrait um, of Caravaggio as the uh, decapitated Goliath, and it's very, very intense, quite obviously. And look at that strong lighting, and the command that Caravaggio had of the human figure. Um, just extraordinary images, powerful um, with this tenebroso. The next painting is uh, certainly not one of my favorite Caravaggio paintings. I find it a little staged and dull and lifeless compared to many of his uh, other more powerful works. This one's not in your book, uh, nor should it be, <laughs> nor should it probably be in my lecture today, but, but there it is. Uh, again, uh, I can't get enough Caravaggio, even one that I don't um, like quite so much uh, for musicians here. Next up is Young Bacchus, which is another self-portrait. Uh, you know, artists really, I mean, they're, they come uh, cheap as models for themselves, so I guess that's one of the reasons. This uh, Young Bacchus, uh, God of Wine, is um, a beautiful, beautiful painting. I actually have a poster of this in, in our uh, dining room at home. Uh, an interesting an aside about this. So I uh, bought the poster in Rome at, uh, at a wonderful shop. Uh, 
and uh, and it's framed and hanging on the wall. And every time I look at it, just as much as I love this painting, well, the poster is printed backwards um, for whatever reason. He's facing the other direction, um, and I find that interesting um, because. Well, in the old days, when I used to teach with slides, that would happen because the slides, you could have them in there backwards. And so I ended up with, and I did that for years. I mean, doing it this way is still new to me, although I've been teaching it this way for, what, three or four years now. But I was used to the slide carousels, which had all kinds of complications, but at the same time, you go forward and backward and all that sort of thing. Anyway, I thought it was, you know, it's just the way I learned and it's the way I taught for a long time. So I, I do have, I had this, problem of not knowing if something was supposed to be this way or something was that way. Maybe you don't care, but it fascinates me. Right here is this amazing still life. Um, and in fact, Caravaggio got his start by painting still lifes and selling them. He caught on with a lot of people for these beautiful still lifes. Now, um, as his paintings developed, you, you'll see less and less of this. There was a glimpse of one that I didn't mention earlier for lots of reasons. But they're not just still lifes, they, they are, um, they're more than that. Um, they, they're telling a story, some, there are insects in some places. I'm not sure on this one, of course, it's not clear enough right now. This is, uh, I've seen this painting live and in person. Uh, here's a rotting pomegranate, for example. A pomegranate is a symbol of the, of the crucifixion um, and of course a perfect time for us to be discussing the crucifixion, I suppose. How about that for timing? Um, and, our, and I wish, and I really need uh, to grab a bit like that. Mark, what's his name? But, you know, it's doing the, anyway. Excuse me, try me. <laughs> Mark Rubio. I like it, I wish I had what he's drinking, um, but that's related. Next up, we have uh, this, another, uh, version of the young Bacchus. This one is sort of known as the jaundiced Bacchus because his coloring is, is just a little bit off, like malaria perhaps, or something like that. Um, and you notice that there are a few grapes in his hand that pr probably aren't worth eating for lots of reasons. This actually, this painting is at the Borghese Gallery in Rome. Uh, the Borghese happens to be my favorite gallery in the entire world. And that's quite a contest. Well, I haven't been to all the galleries in the town. But the favorite gallery that I've ever had the pleasure of being in. And fortunately for me, many times. Um, next up, uh, this one is in your book. This is on page 345. And the title is Boy with a Basket of Fruit. Well, how about that for a weird title? Not worth a bonus point, really. But, uh, but here we have exactly what you see here. Uh, another painting that happens to be in the Borghese. I'm not sure why that would be selected um, to be representative of his work. When you see some of the others that I have in store for you. Next up is, uh, this is Medusa Shield. This happens to be in the Uffizi Gallery in Florence. And of course you see this uh, outrageous image of Medusa. Uh, having the severed head and the blood and so on. Um, it's an unusual painting, uh, to say the least, and it sort of, you know, sticks out in terms of the body of work that Caravaggio has left us. 